My name is Bill Webb, and my call sign is WB7NKR. I served in the uh, U.S. Navy in World War II and Korea as a radioman. Uh, I uh, joined the Navy when I was 17 in uh, early 1943. I, actually, I was 17 in November of 1942. But uh, when I went down to join the following day, I discovered I had a heart murmur, which kids of 17 in those days frequently had. And I spent, I st spent the next uh, six months going weekly trying to join. And finally, the heart murmur went away, and they accepted me. And I went into boot camp at Great Lakes, Illinois. Following boot camp, uh, they asked me if I, uh, what service school I would like to go to, and I said I'd like to be a radioman. And the only reason I had for saying that was that my father had served in World War I as an, as an Army radioman, or corpsman, if you would. Uh, not a corpsman, but a, a signalman. You know, running lines across the grounds and things of that nature. And I always admired the, the courage it took to do that. And uh, so that was the thing that popped into my head, and that's what I asked for, and I got it. And I went to radio school at the University of Chicago, the Navy Department, Bureau of Naval Personnel, Service Schools, the United States of America. This certifies that William Webb has satisfactorily completed his, the prescribed course of study of the Naval Training School Radio University of Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. It was a fine school, and we lived uh, the life of Riley, being housed in a, an old fraternity house, uh, uh, going marching off to school with the girls hanging out the windows, waving at us uh, at the university. And uh, we were taught such things as radio theory, uh, naval procedures as far as communications was, was concerned, and CW taught by radio hams. They were nice guys. I was in radio school from the time I got out of boot camp in September until the following January, at which time I graduated as a seaman first class, which was a notch up from where I'd been. And I volunteered for submarine duty, was sent to New London, Connecticut as a uh, radio man striker, they called him. And when I got there, I discovered that much more training was required, and the war might run off and leave me. And so I talked my way out of that and was sent to New York uh, City, Pier 92, and was transferred from there to the amphibious forces in Virginia. Um, signed to a crew of an LST, that, uh, and we trained <laughs> rather strangely. We, they had a great big black top with a markings of an LST painted in white, and we practiced going to general quarters and, and all the various things that you have aboard ship, only this was a blacktop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once finished, we, went, we were, all went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the ship was being built, went aboard, commissioned it, and floated down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. That was a nice trip, and I wish I had been able to spend all the time at the at the railing, looking at all the scenery, but unfortunately, I was busy in the radio room bringing naval publications up to date. Got to New Orleans, uh, loaded with loaded up with ammunition and supplies. Went from there out into the Gulf of Mexico. I remember we all stood around wondering if who was going to get seasick, uh, <laughs> because ninety-nine percent of the crew had never been to sea before, and uh, fortunately, I didn't. And uh, Away we went, down through the Panama Canal, over to California, and then to Hawaii. Uh, we were in Hawaii for quite a little while, waiting for the next operation, which was the invasion of Iwo Jima. And we started uh, off to the Pacific rather slowly, I thought. LSTs are not very fast, eight or nine knots was their top speed. But uh, we meandered, went through the various island groups and uh, got to Saisei, went, went to Guam, which had just been liberated, Saipan, 
where I visited the grave of one of my best friends who had been a Marine there. Um, sad to think about. And finally, uh, we uh, sailed in, sailed to uh, Iwo Jima, which is uh, in Japanese it means sulfur island, and you can smell it. It's got quite a sulfur smell. And we arrived there uh, at the time of the uh, landings and uh, got up, anchored or directed to anchor right near the base, or about 50 yards out from the base of Mount Suribachi. Uh, we uh, were ordered to take aboard small boat crews, these little landing craft that had carried the Marines ashore, and take care of them. We were, we were the mama of all those little crews. They were two, two and three man crews. Got to see the invasion of Iwo Jima much as we now see a widescreen television or movie. It's it, unfolding uh, right before you. Right before us. Everything. The uh, P-51 Mustangs would come in at one end of the island and we'd see them drop their bombs that would bounce along as they were supposed to and uh, see Japanese running out of their little holes. They were all in, caved in that place and uh, saw a couple of them run down to the beach and the Marines nailed them with a um, armored car. Saw the mouth of Mount Suribachi blown up. It was a great big cave-like thing. And, and uh, rather than try to get in there and dig them out, they just blew it up and there they were. I understood later on the Japanese uh, opened it up and recovered the remains of all those guys. But the Japanese were everywhere. And we sat there doing our job, uh, having air attacks, going to general quarters. Uh, I was in the radio room and that was my general quarters uh, position. We were anchored there at the base of Suribachi. I know we were close enough to shore that we used to shout at the Marines uh, on shore who were walking around shooting in to holes and any little crevice they could on the side of Mount Suribachi uh, and uh, shouted conversations back and forth. And uh, we uh, watched the Marines fighting their way to the top of Mount Suribachi up a path, very narrow little path rock-strewn path, and uh, we'd see them fall and obviously not make it until one day I was standing radio watch in the wheelhouse of this LST where we had mounted some signal, Army Signal Corps radios uh, for local communication between the beach and ourselves and other ships. And uh, suddenly I looked and saw the flag flying on top of Suribachi, which thrilled me to death because I figured we'd finally made it. And so I ran into the wheelhouse and told the guys there what I'd seen. And they rushed out and we were all very happy. And uh, very shortly thereafter, the flag disappeared. And we figured, as I figured anyway, that we had lost our position up there. But later, not too long after that, a flag went up again. And I thought we'd recovered it. Well, I learned many years later after I was home in a civilian that what had happened was they had reached the top and a Navy officer decided the flag that they had raised was too big, too small, and he needed a bigger one. So he sent a runner down to one of the LSTs that was on the beach unloading equipment and uh, got a bigger flag and had it raised. And I, that's what I saw the second time. And I didn't know that for many, many years. The island itself, Oh, and the, and the photographer that took that picture, that was not a, not a posed picture as many people think. It was, he just turned around and saw them doing this and snapped it uh, spontaneously. And so it was not a posed picture, it was a genuine snapshot. And uh, the island itself was, I remember when the Marines went ashore, we were watching them hit, hit the beach. The sulfur sand, and it was a mixture of, it was smelled awful. You'd, when you get your face on it, like some of the Marines had to, it, it, it was terrible. And uh, they let the first three waves, as I recall, hit the beach without it firing back, the enemy, that is, the Japanese. And uh, I remember writing that down you know, in a report, that uh, it looked like an easy thing until after the third wave, and then they opened up from all of these positions on Mount Suribachi and all of their cave openings and so forth. 
just wipe the, the poor kids out. It was a bad, bad place to be.